Hello. Thank you for joining me to find out what all the fuss is about with the Miller's Tale from Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. If you're a little shocked to find a book that was written in the 1390s on this list, um, stay with me. You'll find out why. It's caused a lot of trouble over the years. Uh, but it is impressive that an author is still causing trouble more than 600 years after he died. Chaucer died in 1400. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty good run. Um, I think before we get into why the book has caused so much trouble, we need to look a little bit about sort of when it was written, how people were reading then, um, and also very quickly um, talk about the bit I'm not really going to get into. So I'll start there. Uh, if you were hoping this was going to be a talk on how Chaucer got embroiled in the Western schism and irritated the church, I'm sorry, he did do those things uh, a bit. The Western schism is referring to the period when uh, there were two popes, uh, but he doesn't do it in the Miller's Tale. So we're not gonna get into that today. Uh, the Miller's Tale, has quite a lot in it that causes enough trouble. Um, so how books were circulated at this time. When Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales in the 1390s, uh, only about five or 10% of the population could even read. And only some of those people were interested in reading in English. So amongst the literate population, you have people in the church. They are primarily reading in Latin and some French aristocrats who are primarily reading in French and sort of civil service level people. That's where Chaucer fits in. They are the ones who are reading in English. Uh, Chaucer, Civil servant isn't quite the right word for his career. It was varied. He held a few different posts and does seem to have worked for what we would now call Her Majesty's Secret Service. So yes, he did work as a spy. And in addition to that, he wrote the Canterbury Tales and quite a few other works. Um, so only a few people can read at this time. Uh, the, the sort of readership uh, in the way that we use that term now for the Canterbury Tales doesn't really apply. This is before printing. The Gutenberg Press wasn't invented until 1436. Chaucer died in 1400. So whenever we talk about people reading the Canterbury Tales in the 1390s, and you know, up until Caxton printed the first edition, first printed edition of the Canterbury Tales in 1476, it's circulating in manuscript form. So if someone wanted a copy, they had to pay a scribe to copy it out by hand. You can imagine how time consuming and expensive that would be. So we've got a very extremely limited readership here. So we're not getting into the kinds of issues with censorship to protect groups of people. Now, whenever we talk about protecting people, it's generally children. In the 19th century, people got, I think, a little too worried about what women were reading. So we're, you know, we're not talking about protecting groups of people because those protected groups couldn't read. They didn't have to worry about what they were reading. Um, so when the Canterbury Tales caused a bit of a kerfuffle at the time of writing, it was with the church, because if a work was going to be suppressed in the medieval period, it was by the church. That's who had the authority and the interest in doing so. Once works get into print and literacy rates go up, you start seeing works banned for other reasons. So with the Canterbury Tales, it's banned by the Comstock Law, which was passed in the US in 1873 for being obscene. Um, it does have some lewd passages. That's one of the things Chaucer is known for. Um, and it, it continues to be banned for being obscene. 
through the 20th century when the Canterbury Tales was um, translated into modern English and reprinted. Often printers would either leave out the, um, the rude bits of the Miller's Tale, the Reeves Tale. Sorry, I can't think there, there are two others that are a bit um, rude. Or they just rewrite them to clean them up. Um, not sure what's left in the Miller's tail once you take all the sex out of it, but that's what they did. So um, the Miller's tail, or the Canterbury Tales as a whole, has been around for a long time. It's caused concern for a wide variety of people. Um, in the 21st century, the most common reason for it to cause problems is people insisting that it's obscene and shouldn't be read. And um, a lot of people who make, make those arguments tend to wanna to just throw out the entire Canterbury Tales because they don't like the Miller's Tale. I'd be very surprised if any of them finished it, or finished the, what we have at the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer did die before he finished them. Um, the other reason Chaucer makes it into the news these days are in uh, discussions around decolonizing the syllabus in English departments and universities. In 2021, at uh, Leicester University, the department said that they were going to, you know, cut their Chaucer unit so that they could decolonize the syllabus. What does that mean? Decolonizing the syllabus is, means um, opening up the texts that are taught on, in this case, an English course, to include more writers who aren't white European men. Lots of us, myself included, think this is a very good thing. It does mean that if you're going to make space for these writers who aren't white men, you're gonna to have to start giving a little less space to some of the white men. Um, Lester decided that the medieval English unit was less relevant, so we're going to cut those things and focus on um, later time periods and a more diverse um, syllabus. That's going to irritate some people. Anytime people start talking about changing the syllabus, whether it's to add women writers in or writers of color, it's necessarily going to mean taking out some white male writers, you're going to have arguments. Scholars argue. That's what they do. Um, we're very good at it. So those are the main reasons you see Chaucer pop up in headlines from time to time, even 622 years after he died. Um, with the Miller's Tale in particular, it is a bit racy. Um, You've got adultery, you've got sexual pranks. There's a lot going on in it that you can see would irritate some more conservative readers. Chaucer anticipated this. He has the host say, um, but if you don't want to read it, turn the page. So we'll get to that in just a minute. Whenever you read about People, whether they're scholars or parents' associations, complain about Chaucer, um, and especially like Chaucer's views of women or Chaucer's views of um, Jews, you'll find that they are conflating Chaucer's characters with Chaucer, the historical person who created those characters. Um, Chaucer has some anti Semitic characters. Scholars who have studied Chaucer for years and read all of his work tend to come to the conclusion that Chaucer himself wasn't anti Semitic, but his some of his characters were. Um, Chaucer himself does seem to have come to we really need more words for this. Feminist is not the right term at all for referring to Chaucer, but he does seem to be more sympathetic to women's um, feelings and situation than 
you would expect from a 14th century writer. Um, but some of his characters are misogynist. So whenever you read about or hear about people complaining about an author, whether it's Chaucer or somebody else, always check whether they're complaining about the author or something the author had a character say. Because the author can have all sorts of reasons for having characters say important things. In the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer knew that his readership was going to be as varied as the speakers in the Canterbury Tales. The Canterbury Tales are about a group of pilgrims on a pilgrimage to Canterbury, uh, hence the name. And the idea is that as they walk to Canterbury, they're going to take it in turn to tell a tale to entertain the group. The first tale is told by the knight. It is a very chivalrous, moral romance. And the second tale is told by the miller, sort of the anti-romance. Um, what Chaucer is doing here is partly showing off because sort of each tale is in a slightly different genre. He's showing off that he can write in all of these genres and that he can write from wildly different points of view. Um, he's also just keeping things interesting. If you were to take things literally and forget that it's fiction, whenever you read the um, prologue to the Miller's Tale, the host is trying to get the miller to shut up and let the monk speak because he says we're going to you know, proceed in an orderly fashion. The knight told his tale and we're just going to go down the, the list of rank. And you're just a miller, so you need to be quiet until we get to you. Well, the miller is drunk and he's having none of it. And then Chaucer has the host say um, he, the miller, this is, if you've got the book with you, uh, line 3168. He would not refrain from speaking for any man, but told his churl's tale in his manner. So the host has tried to get the, uh, the miller to shut up the, um, I think the reeve and the knight chime in. And the miller's not going to be quiet. He's decided he's going next. So, you know, might as well let him. Then the, so line 3170, the host says, I regret, I must repeat it here. And therefore every respectable person I pray for God's love, think not that I speak out of evil intention, but because I must repeat all their tales, be they better or worse, or else I must falsify some of my material. And therefore whoever does not want to hear it, turn over the leaf and choose another tale. There are Chaucer's, host is just saying, I'm just reporting what people said. Um, I have to report it as they said it, or I have to lie. So uh, don't blame me. And if you don't want to read this tale, turn the page and read something else. Um, and then for he, he meaning the reader, shall find enough of every sort of historical matter that concerns nobility, and also morality and holiness. Blame not me if you choose amiss. So there are lots of different kinds of tales in this collection. If you choose to read one that offends you, that's your problem, is basically what he's saying. So blame not me if you choose a mess. Don't blame me if you make a mistake. And he goes on, the miller is a churl, you know this well, so was the reeve also and many others, and rivaled, rivaled, sorry, rivaled reed they told, both of the two. Think about this and don't blame me and also people should not take a joke too seriously. So this is a, a tongue in cheek uh, statement from the host saying, you've been warned, this tale is going to be uh, full of ribaldry or lewd um, humor. And if that offends you, don't read it. You don't have to, turn the page. So that is you know, important in the sense that he's announcing that he's showing off in this collection because if you don't like this kind and just turn the page, you can read another kind. I've written all sorts, uh, but he's also talking about mentioning turning the page. He's drawing attention to the fact that this is a text. Um, 
That's important. Not too long before this was written, most literature was uh, transmitted in oral forms. There are times earlier in Chaucer's career where he seems to be unsure about whether he's an oral poet or a written or readerly poet. He's coming down firmly on the side of this being a written text that people will be reading um, and drawing attention to that. He's also drawing attention to, as I've said before, the different genres that he's writing in. In his chapter in the Cambridge Companion to the Canterbury Tales on the comedy in the Canterbury Tales, or sorry, Cambridge Companion to Chaucer, not the Canterbury Tales, uh, Derek Pearsall writes, quote, romance asserts the possibility that men may behave in a noble and self-transcending manner. Fablio declares the certainty that they will always behave like animals. The Miller's tale is a Fablio. The Knight's tale is a romance. So by romance, he doesn't mean you know, bodice rippers. He means tales of um, chivalry, noble, nobility, um, morality. And the fablio are body tales about sex. Um, it was a common genre in French literature. There aren't that many true fablio in English and the Miller's Tale is the, the best fablio in English. Um, for the most part, romance, talks about the lives of the upper classes. So the knight's tale is about a knight. Um, Fablio tends to talk about what we would now call the middle classes. Uh, and the topics are, accord are sort of, you know, lowered accord accordingly. Uh, in Fablio, you tend to have two men competing for a woman's sexual attentions. That woman is almost invariably younger than her husband and neither of the men competing with her or her husband. So um, in that sense, the Miller's Tale is absolutely on genre. You do get a lot of wordplay in the, the French fabliaux that I've read. Um, they like to play with the idea that women have two sets of lips. Um, in the, I think it's the long assed Beringer, a woman cross dresses and presents herself as uh, a Beringer. I think that's a knight. Sorry, it's been 20 years since I read it. And um, the, the long ass from the title refers to somebody sees her bend over and notes that her, her what seems to be her ass crack is very long and goes through, and there's nothing hanging down um, to stop the view because she's a woman, um, you end up with women with um, speaking vaginas and all sorts. In The Miller's Tale, it's not quite that um, body centric, but it is a bit. I mean, early on, whenever Nicholas is trying to get Absalom's attention, he grabs her by the quaint. This is line 3276. Quaint means crotch. Former US president wasn't as original as he thought he was. So you are dealing with sex presented in very frank, open terms. Um, I think the big difference between Nicholas and the former president is Absalom goes, is a willing participant. Um, he does that just before they start hatching their plan for um, them to have a night together, uh, get her husband out of the way so that they can share the bed. Um, so that's why the Miller's Tale tends to cause quite a lot of trouble uh, amongst parents groups, especially. Uh, it's all about sex and it is. In sort of as an overview for any of you who haven't read it yet um, or who looked at it and said, <laughs> I'm not reading that. I know it can be a bit intimidating being faced with even a translation of Middle English. Um, the Miller's Tale is told by the Miller 
and it's about a carpenter who has married a, a much younger woman and taken in a lodger who is a student. The idea that you know the the older man is worrying that he's going to be cuckolded by his wife is I mean it was an old joke when Chaucer was talking about it, but it's still with us now. Um, the carpenter is insanely jealous and Absalom, or not Absalom, sorry, Allison's a bit bored. Nicholas, young student who lives with them, he's studying astronomy and astrology. And if you've read it and you couldn't find the distinction between the two, that's because there really wasn't one in the 14th century. Um, and Allison's attracted to Nicholas. He's the younger man in the house. He's a bit more um, refi refined. He's at the university. He's just more interesting than her older husband. Um, so husband is out for the day. That's when Nicholas grabs Allison by her quaint and they start talking and she's like, you know, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll be happy to sleep with you, but you've got to get my husband out of the way first. They eventually hatch a plan that um, Nicholas is going to pretend to have gotten a message from the stars, or from God. He conflates the two, um, telling him that the second noetic flood is coming and that the only way for them to save themselves is for the carpenter to get three large tubs, affix them in the rafters in the house, punch a, a hole through the wall, um, in the rafters and put enough provisions for one day in each of the tubs. And then on the appointed night, Nicholas, Allison, and the carpenter will go up, sit in their tubs. They're not allowed to speak. And the carpenter's tub has to be as far away from Allison's as possible. And they'll sit there and wait for the flood to come. And then they'll cut the rope holding the tubs up and float out the hole in the wall wait for the floods to go down and uh, then repopulate the earth. The carpenter goes along with it. Um, he's never really shown to have much sense. So he gets these tubs, he fixes them in the roof. They all climb up there. Once the carpenter is snoring, Allison and Nicholas climb down. They go down to the marital bed, um, have their entertainment for the night. When they're in the throes of passion, uh, or maybe just after they finished, um, Absalom comes to the window. He's already been to the window once when Allison was in bed with the carpenter. So she's not surprised by this. Absalom is a clerk. He's presented as a bit uh, fussy and effeminate. Um, at one point it says that he's very squeamish, or he's made squeamish by the ideas of farts. And um, he's in love with Allison. So he comes to the window, he's determined to profess his love and he's not leaving until she kisses him. So she turns to Nicholas and says, watch this. Um, sticks her bum out the window. Absalom kisses her anus. He doesn't realize that there's something amiss until he realizes that Allison doesn't have a beard. And yet I'm noticing hair. Uh, he figures out what was going on and um, takes himself off to the, the blacksmiths to get a red hot poker to come back and teach Allison a lesson. He comes back, Nicholas says, no, now it's my turn, sticks his bum out the window and instead of Absalom kissing it, he gets a red hot poker up the bum. Um, Then Nicholas starts screaming for water because the red hot poker has pulled skin off. It's burning, he's in a lot of pain. The carpenter hears the screams for the water, assumes that means that the floods have come, cuts the rope, flies out the, the hole in the wall and uh, crashes. He doesn't die, uh, but he is injured. And Allison and Nicholas tell the people who wonder what's going on, um, that he's gone crazy and the carpenter thinks the second noetic flood is coming and um, 
Yeah, so he looks like a fool in two ways. He's been cuckolded or cheated on by his wife and um, the whole town thinks that he's lost his mind. Um, the Sorry, completely lost my train of thought. The tale ends with a nice little summary. These are the last five lines, I think, six maybe. Thus Scrooge was this carpenter's wife, in spite of all his guarding and his jealousy, and Absalom had kissed his, her lower eye, and Nicholas is scalded in the rump. This tale is done, and God save all this company. If you watch... Um, what is it called? Big Bang Theory, the sitcom. You may remember the episode in which um, Bernadette and Amy are, I think Amy was reading Chaucer and she's chuckling over the idea of um, Absalom kissing her nether yaya. That's her lower eye. Um, that's in line 3852. The, um, more morally minded readers, the ones that the, the host is addressing uh, at the in the prologue where he says, you know, if you're gonna be offended by this, don't read it. Their problem with this is that it, it doesn't really teach anything except that, um, you know, Nicholas is the only one who's really, well, I guess Absalom is punished. Nicholas is the, the other one who's punished here. And that's mostly because he wasn't smart. In um, his chapter on the comedy and the Canterbury Tales, Pearsall talks about this a bit. Allison's never punished because she's clever. The one thing you must not be in Fadlio is stupid. And Nicholas just copies her. He doesn't think for himself. So that's why he ends up with a poker up the bum. And Absalom really just makes a fool of himself. He's one of the more obnoxious characters in literature. And the the carpenter, there's the bit fairly early on in the tale where uh, the miller says, you know, the carpenter clearly didn't pay attention to any of the lessons that like should marry like, meaning a, a young and beautiful woman should marry a young and beautiful man. Because if an old man marries a young woman, there are gonna be problems. Um, and it's presented as sort of, uh, a commonplace lesson or almost a cliche, even at the beginning of the Canterbury Tales, this idea has been around for a long time. And uh, so, you know, that's why it's not, the, the text doesn't really judge Alison. She didn't do anything wrong. She's just being who she is. She is a young, beautiful, vibrant woman and she's not punished. Uh, which I think is a lot of the problem that people who uh, have issues with women and sexuality have with this text is that the woman's not punished. Um, though, as you'll see later in se this season, whenever we get to uh, Scarlet Letter, even when a woman's punished for enjoying sex, that's an issue for some people. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, you know, the main takeaways from this episode and really the podcast generally as don't buy into other people's judgments until you've learned about the text for yourself then you can draw your own conclusions and uh, next time i'll be talking about john ford's tis pity she's a whore which is the most banned play in english so far as i know um if you're going to be offended by discussions of um Incest, it's not the episode for you. The, the main characters are a brother and sister and they have a disastrous incestuous relationship. So I hope you enjoy this sort of whistle stop tour through scandalous literature. And um, if you want an opportunity to discuss the literature with me, I am in the weeks between episodes running 
um, discussion groups, they will normally be paid, but the ones for episode one, which will happen next week, which is the week beginning the 11th of April, uh, will be free sort of taster sessions. So if you want to join those, click the link uh, in the show notes and join me. Um, we will talk about what you thought about the text, what you thought about why it's been banned over the years and anything else that comes up. And um, yeah, I hope to see lots of you there. If you have any questions, um, let me know. You can reach me at jennifer at scandalousbooks.co.uk. So until next time, happy reading.